<clears throat> My name is David Harris. I'm the managing director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at Harvard Law School. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Dean Nino and Professor Olsey for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and uh, this is a very special occasion, and uh, we are uh, excited about the film we're going to see. Uh, for those of you who noted the publicity, uh, today's event is co-sponsored uh, by the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Uh, unfortunately, neither Abby Wolf nor Professor Gates could be with us today, but uh, this is an idea that uh, uh, was born from a conversation that Abby and I had, and we said that we have to get this movie here, and uh, I'm really pleased to be able to say that we have it. Uh, you'll also notice that today's uh, Screening is actually part of our participation in the Stand Against Racism. This is the third year the Institute has participated, and it means a great deal to us to be part of this uh, every year. Uh, the, the, the real kickoff is not until uh, next week and when most uh, events will take place, but you know how we are. We're either late or late. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, hate to go uh, But I'm, I feel especially lucky because this is co-sponsored today by the uh, Cambridge YWCA. And I'm pleased to have with us today Eva Martin Blythe, the executive director of the Cambridge Y, uh, who will tell us a little bit about the Stand uh, Against Racism program. YWCA nationally and locally is eliminating racism, empowering women. The YWCA USA Stand Against Racism <coughs> is a movement to bring people together from all walks of life across the country to raise awareness that great racism still exists. And if we had somehow lulled ourselves into thinking that racism didn't exist, had ceased to be a problem, all we had to do was look at Overland Park, Kansas last week. That's a place that's very close to me. I lived in Overland Park. I grew up in Kansas. I know the Jewish Community Center. I know the housing facility where uh, one, of the, uh, one of the victims was, was murdered. It just is, it was mind-boggling to me to, to hear the news, to see the news. It was like I looked at the television and said, is this happening? Am I really hearing this? But I think that I don't think, I know that. This is a reflection of, that situation is a reflection of what is going on around us. So let us not be deluded, let us not be lulled, let us not be um, in any way deri or derailed from thinking that racism still exists. Much has changed, but much is still the same. Our work is ahead of us. During the month of April, as David has indicated, <clears throat> with a focus particularly on Friday, April 25th, the official Stand Against Racism Day. YWCA's across the country are par participating in Stand Against Raci Racism activities along with like-minded organizations that share our vision of eliminating racism and celebrating the richness <coughs> and diversity of the communities in our country. We are grateful and want to pay special thanks to the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute and David Harris in particular, for allowing us, for inviting us to be a co-sponsor of today's documentary screening as our local Stand Against Racism initiative. I also want to acknowledge one of our board members, Andrea Spears Jackson, who has been very instrumental, worked with David in, in, in arranging the logistics of today for us to be part of this, and then she's sick. So in her absence, I certainly want to acknowledge um, her role in helping to make this day possible. We have a number of board members and staff members here, and I hope that before the day is over, before the evening is over, um, that you'll have an opportunity to meet and talk with some of them. And can I just ask our board members and our staff members to raise their hands? We have materials here on the, uh, on the desk in the front. We have buttons, we have stickers, we have bookmarks. Um, 
We have brochures about the YWCA. We have information about upcoming activities, and we hope that you'll take advantage and, and take some of that material home and read it and learn more about us. And certainly, <coughs> as you read it and learn more about us, please be in touch with us. We like to believe that we are doing a tremendous job of empowering women. We are the largest provider of housing for women in the Cambridge community. We aren't doing as good a job. We acknowledge that we aren't doing as good a job in our work to eliminate racism. We open our doors, we open our hearts, we open our arms to those who would like to join us in framing the work that we will do in this area going forward. Thank you. that are going on. There's some really fabulous programs throughout the region uh, that you can be part of and it would mean a great deal. I want to do a few announcements before we get to the film, some upcoming events we have coming uh, over the next month or so. On next Thursday, April 24th, we are extremely pleased to welcome uh, Christina Halpern Lewis, Christina Lewis Halpern, uh, who is the daughter of Reginald Lewis, who at the time of her birth was the richest African-American in the United States, to put it bluntly. Uh, and he was an amazing man who uh, accomplished a great deal. And uh, we're very fortunate that our offices sit in the Reginald Lewis uh, uh, Center for International Law Building. This event will be next Thursday at noon in the Lewis uh, Hall. On May 15th, uh, we'd like to have him join us. We'll join with the Labor and Work Life Center at Harvard Law School in presenting uh, the film Brother Outsider, The Life of Bayard Rustin. Uh, this is a fabulous film, it's an important film, and it's a film that we will use uh, as an occasion uh, to mark the 60th anniversary of the Board for Super Round of Education decision. We, think, we can think of fewer people around whom to uh, organize a discussion in Bayard Rustin, and we encourage you to join us for that. Uh, and that will be, uh, uh, we just learned today, here in Milstein uh, at 4 o'clock uh, on May 15th. Then on May 17th, the actual anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, we will sponsor another candidates forum uh, along with Middlesex Community College uh, at uh, Emerson College. And this will be for the uh, uh, candidates for Attorney General, uh, and that will be at 4 o'clock and we encourage you to come down to Emerson for that. Um, and uh, as always, all of our events are free and open to the public. Uh, I don't expect you'll remember all that I've said, so I invite you to visit our website. And if you don't receive uh, our regular emails, sign up on the website to do so. So now it's finally uh, my uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Shala Lynch, uh, who will in turn introduce her from, no, no, not yet, I have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's not that easy, right? I have to say some stuff. <laughs> uh, so so th this film uh, will speak for itself, and you will see that. But you should know that over the last decade, Shala has been one of the most productive uh, 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 film producers that we know, and she's uh, made a, 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 a really gracious film uh, called Chisholm 72, Unbought and Unbossed, about really one of America's heroes, Shirley <coughs> Chisholm, and has uh, worked with Ken Burns on numerous projects in the past, and has uh, produced and written uh, series programs for all the major uh, creative networks uh, in the United States. And so now I'll stop and ask her to introduce her film. And uh, will you join me in giving her a warm welcome? Pretty good. I thought he was just going to read the bio. No. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me here. I am honored to be here uh, in Boston at Harvard Square. <laughs> all right, I won't do any more accents. Um, and I, and there's really nothing to say about the film before the film except what I'm going to say. Um, <clears throat> it took eight years to make. Films about women are very difficult to make. Films about women uh, when the lead character is a woman of color are even harder to make, especially when their politics are left of left of left. <laughs> and um, the, 
it, it took foundation grants, it took another country, France, about a third of the budget came to France, I worked with two French producers there, and only after that point was I able to come back to the United States and we were able to leverage the money um, to finish the film from a very surprising place actually. Because when they called me up, they said, well, we heard, we're hearing about the Angeles Davis film. This will be great. You know, we, we really like to help you. Can we buy the television rights? And I said, listen, you can't afford me. Forget it. No way. I was grouchy. It was taking too long to make the film. I want to finish the film. And the vice president of programming called me up and said, um, no. She gave me the low voice. You know, when, when the executives give you the low voice, you know you're, they're being serious. She said, Shala, we're serious. This was BET Networks. They put in half a million dollars before the film, before a frame of the film ever existed. And I particularly say that to this audience because perhaps the students behind, what might not be, you know, makers, but when you're executives and you're part of the fabric of corporations that support this work, it's, it's important. Um, and so beyond that, I will, oh, I, yes, so it uh, premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2012. We were given a gala presentation. Angela came and walked over in carpet. <laughs> Danny Glover came in solidarity. <laughs> um, it, uh, t you know, it's done a great film festival run. It was picked up by Lionsgate and Code Black, as you may see. We were in theaters, AMC theaters. Um, last year, um, it's aired on BET, and now it's out on DVD and iTunes and digital download. Um, we've been nominated for a bunch of awards. The one that I'm most proud of is one we, is, is it, an award that we won recently, the NAACP Image Award. Woo! Best documentary. So, after that, I, I look for it. So I look, for, but it is a pr political crime drama with a love story at the center. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. it's also a documentary. Mm -hmm. Enjoy, and I look forward to a very spirited discussion, and I am not afraid of you. Bring it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, what do we think? Thank you so much. Um, uh, we think uh, that Professor Ogletree is actually on his way, uh, but uh, I, I want to make sure that we have a chance to continue some conversation. So, Shell, I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk a little bit and answer some questions. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess the, one of the things I'd like to say before opening up to questions um, is that this was a terribly difficult story to tell. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> it's really tremendously complicated. Um, and that the film was pretty awful for a very long time. Like, all the pieces would be there, but they were not in the right order. Nothing was at the right length. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and central to that is, you know, the crime and the relationship to um, the trial. And how do you convey in a surface medium, which is what a film is, it's something that can grab you, but you, you're severely limited by time. You don't have footnotes. There's no appendix. <laughs> You, can't, you don't really have a lot of parenthetical clauses, even. <laughs> um, how do you tell the story of, of, of a very complicated trial, and a trial that, in a way, broke incredibly new ground? Uh, there are so many things about this story that I, I hadn't realized, um, from, from um, metal detectors at court, in courtrooms didn't happen before, before this moment. I mean, you could, go to the, you could go to the airport, you didn't have any security. Incredible, right? <laughs> um, for little things like that to kind of the bigger things um, about how the lawyers conducted the trial, specifically around, and this we couldn't, ha didn't have time in the film, how they selected the jury. It was really incredible. They got the voter rolls for all of San Jose. It's a small community. It was several thousand people. They had so many volunteers that they had volunteers go out with the name and address, and they, and they, it's what we call in the archival world collected metadata. They looked around, they saw the bumper stickers, they could tell, <laughs> they look, they, you know, you can't, you can't knock on people's doors, but there's a lot of information you can tell by the things that people have in their environment. And just simply by observation, they collected data. So when they were in the courtroom and somebody came up, they knew a lot about that person. 
before the internet, before Google, <laughs> before. And so they knew, they had a sense of the kind of juror that was a possibility, and they fought for several people. I mean, you notice that it was a, a they called it an all-white jury, but there was actually one Hispanic man. There was a big fight over the one woman of color, black woman, and the prosecutor won that fight, so there, she was not on, not on the jury. Um, but the work that they were able to do to prepare the jury, and then I, I was able, at Stanford, actually, University, um, the head juror, Mary Timothy, uh, talked into a tape recorder every night. She, you know, she couldn't talk to anybody. It was driving her absolutely nuts. <laughs> so she could talk to a tape recorder. The only problem with it from a filmmaking point of view is she obviously did it lying down. <laughs> and so, and after dinner, uh, oh, nah. <laughs> But from the transcripts, the content, so you know, I couldn't use it. I couldn't really use it in the film. <laughs> so in a filmmaker's world, if you can't use it in the film, it doesn't exist, right? So it's like, shuck. So working on the book, that's what I have to. <laughs> But um, it was really interesting to listen to her talk about um, her perception of Angela at the beginning and, and um, what this trial was about, and basically how the prosecution lost that trial. Lost that trial because he focused too much on the crime in which Angela and the team had already said, yeah, it happened, those are our guns. Um, and then he, and, and that was a really big thing because day after day after day, they felt like they were being bored by ballistics and things that weren't helping decide whether she was guilty or innocent. The other thing they were able to, the, so the other thing she talked about is, so while the prosecutor was doing all of that, all of the jurors had a chance to get to know her in the courtroom and saw her mother and father there every day saw her family, would have to walk through and see the protesters, free Angela Davis, free Angela Davis every day. And so then the burden for them was to put away this person, not just the idea of her, the two-dimensional figure, that angry militant young lady, but Angela Davis, the young philosophy professor from a good background whose parents were showing up every day. And it became a real thing for them in, um, in, during deliberation. I mean, there's so many things to talk about, so rather than me just ramble on, <laughs> um, why don't I open it up to questions? Because I know there's not only lawyers in the room. <laughs> Any filmmakers? I don't think so. Any filmmakers? No? Okay. <laughs> Yes? Where did you get most of your own there is no one place for footage ever um, for a story like this. Uh, and in fact, most of this footage has never seen the light of day. So, so for instance, we might know about the, the, the moment of the Black Panther um, shootout. But the news organization shoots that day. They shoot all this, all this footage. They do a, a one minute story. And the rest of it goes into a box and goes tucked away. And often, it doesn't have any, mar uh, any information on it. So it wasn't like, oh, Angela Davis on the sideline talks to a reporter, you know. Um, so we were able to get inside with um, the news organizations and by date and be, uh, go into the deep archives to be able to find things. And we helped them identify a lot of material. So mainly the news organizations, um, local California organizations, private collectors, um, Angela herself, her family, um, and a fair amount of footage came from Europe as well, particularly the uh, Free Angela material. And the other thing I'll say about this is um, that a lot of our archival material, which is the evidence of our existence in the world, um, is being held hostage by uh, corporations because the cost of accessing it um, for reference. So for me, if you're a scholar of the 60s, 70s, et cetera, and you're not looking at footage, you're not looking at photographs, you have no idea what you're missing. Because when you see the footage, you can report firsthand. You can say, OK, this is what I see from what's going on. And each generation, our eyes see something different, you know? Um, so that's my um, stump <laughs> about that. Yes? Did the uh, defense attorneys ever address the guns in court in terms of, of how they, what they, where they got the guns? Or was that addressed? Because I didn't see that. In yes. The so the defense attorneys decided that um, 
that they were not going to be defensive about all of these things. These guns were absolutely registered in Angela Davis's name. Um, but what is clear, what they made clear, is the relationship between Jonathan Jackson and Angela Davis. They um, had kind of like a sibling relationship. You know, she, she was with her often, and he was sometimes her bodyguard. Um, so she, he had access to her guns very easily. But it was also it was also 1970. So if you were part of the Soldad Brothers, free the Soldad Brothers movement, and you went to the clubhouse, the gun rack was in the closet. But it wasn't like it, it was under combination lock, like the keys were in the kitchen and the drawer that everybody knew about, you know, and nothing was locked. Nothing was locked, not even the front doors. And so he had access. Um, and so the question is, what did she know before the uh, time, uh, before the event? Um, and my sense, well, my sense is the verdict is the correct one. That is from all the things that I, and I had the FBI files, I was able to comb through everything. And you know, you start a film like this and you're like, wouldn't it be awesome to be the film, well, you don't, you don't think of it in personal terms, but it, it would be better for my career if I had found out she was guilty, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Young woman, black woman tells a story about a black woman. It, it, you're almost, it's almost believed that, that you've done due diligence. But when you do due diligence and you find out that she's actually innocent, <laughs> It's, it's kind of culturally anticlimactic. Anti um, and, and so there's weird politics around it. And I know this in part because I had bloggers accuse me um, after we launched at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, you know, you've made up a lot of this story. There's certain things. There's no way that, 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 that George and, Al and Angela ever met. This is your imagination. And I'm like, dude. FBI files. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, exactly. So the politics are, are, are always um, very interesting around all of that. But I, 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 do, I, do, I do suspect that in retrospect, when you look back on certain moments in your life, um, uh, and this is a question I didn't, I didn't have a chance to ask her in the interview, but I, one I want to ask her, what, what, were there any signs? You know, you can look back and go, oh my gosh, that's what he was talking about. I mean, I think that would be the, if anything, it's that. He was so, um, in fact, the argument they used to have in their letters, they would write, also write letters to one another, um, Jonathan, mm -hmm. as well as George, they would argue over misogyny. Um, he was apparently a real sexist, and she was trying to <laughs> reform him. <laughs> so I can't imagine this young 17-year-old going, yes, Angela, tell me what to do. You know, I'm the man, you're the woman. I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense in, in that. Yeah. Yes? I didn't have, have a chance to see all of Mary Timothy's book, but uh, I wonder if I could ask whether she reflected or anyone else who had been on the jury gave us more information, as they always ask jurors coming out. Uh, what influenced you, uh, uh, what was important, what was the dynamic in the jury room for someone being on a jury uh, that can be tense. And I, I was also going to, I don't know if you want to say anything more about the Tina Apfiger or her distinguished father in terms of whether they had any more roles to play that, that you can convey. Mm -hmm. um, well, about the jury, I think that the trial took so long that they had in their minds each deliberated. And what she says about the trial is she expected to go into the jury room and for it to be a really contentious fight. But it had taken so long that so many people really had come to the same conclusion um, that they, the reasonable doubt piece was the part that they couldn't quite get over. Um, and so that it didn't take as long. They wanted to review certain bits of evidence, but it didn't, it didn't take as long. Um, and in terms of Bettina Apfecker, um, one, of the, one of the subtexts of the story that I find um, quite lovely is really, you know, part of me wanted to call it the three little girls, you know, Angela Davis, Bettina Apfecker, and Margaret Burnham, who all knew each other from being young people and grown up together. And then when Angela is in this trouble, they show up. I mean, who does that anymore? Do, do people show, do we show up for each other like that? I mean, they stop their lives, they come, they work for free. The lawyers practically work for free. I mean, it's astonishing. The movement part of this is really astonishing. And I think for that alone, like to see how movements are kind of built and the kind of uh, dedication that it takes um, is, is one, of the, one, of the, one of the highlights for me 
of the story. And of course, that's not how I pitched it. Can you imagine me with an executive pitching? Yeah, so it's a really important story about how movements are made, you know? Yeah. No. <laughs> Political crime drama with a love story at the center. Yeah. But even then, I'll, I'll tell you the most interest. One of the most memorable um, exchange, exchanges with an, um, an executive was: I went through this very dramatic political crime drama love story at the center. You know, it'll be built this way. You know, not just verite, historical verite. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I finish, and he goes, "So let me understand this. You're only interviewing senior citizens." <laughs> Okay, you don't get it. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, if you're going to go in and that's your view of Angela, I, I'm, I've already lost. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, this plays right into what you just said. Uh, Thank you first for preserving this for all of us uh, in a way that we needed far more than we realize. I'm wondering, we're one, we're two generations away from this. What kind of learning you think is still occurring among those who see this movie and who respond to it, who were not alive, who never experienced, maybe their parents didn't experience it, that convinces you of its value for those who are so distant from it? Uh, you know, I, that's, an, that's very, when I think, when I'm making a film, this film in particular, I was thinking about two audiences always. I was thinking about, not so much Angela, um, but that, her generation. So those of you that live through it, you have a certain kind of emotional feeling about the, about the movement. You want to feel some of that energy um, so that it is just, it's not just about the facts, it's about the filmmaking and galvanizing e e the emotional quality. But if I do that right, um, then a younger generation will have an emotional memory about a moment that they never lived. Because they, it, it will make sense logically for them, and it will make sense visually. Um, they'll come away with some sense of having experienced it. Um, and I've seen that happen. You know, after the one of the first screenings, um, uh, Angela, some of her cousins, her nieces and nephews, came up to me. And they're like, oh my goodness. Now we get it. We had no idea. Like, everybody would talk about Angela Davis and the politics and free Angela, blah, 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 blah. but we had no understanding of how it fit into the context. We didn't know what it meant. And now we see her in a completely different light. We have some sense of what they must have actually gone through, the good and the bad, the, the, the trauma. I mean, and a film is, a, a film is a, like a collage as well. So it is a shorthand for the time. I mean, the music plays a role, the editing plays a role, the, t the tempo plays a role. And so I think for younger folks, it can be attractive that way, and then they'll learn something about um, why they're rocking an Angela Davis t-shirt, right? <laughs> I used to rock the t-shirt and not know the story. <laughs> yes? Quick question. <clears throat> the title. Yes. Because okay, that's the free all political prisoners. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? About your... Sure. Um, so but this is actually not that funny, but, uh, you know, Angela Davis, I didn't work with her per se, but it took me about a year to talk her into it and et cetera. And the politics were important for her. She was less interested in the personal story. Um, and in fact, when we were on panels together, I, you know, somebody will say, well, this is your life. How does that, how does that feel? And she goes, well, it's Shala's film because I don't see my life as a political crime drama with a love story at the center. <laughs> Right, and that if it were up to her, it, w it wouldn't have any any of that. Um, but it was really important for her that that um, the movement be a, a character. Um, and, and so, my thought was, we'll call it Free Angela and All Political Prisoners until you know the same executive who is going to complain about everybody being a senior citizen that I interview says, oh, we have to shorten it to Free Angela. And you know what? Nobody ever asked me to change it. So I could keep it as free Angela and all political prisoners, because to me it adds a certain texture about the story that wouldn't be available otherwise. And it's not just about her. And it's powerful. And it's powerful. It's powerful. That's so it's just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Tag team. <laughs> OK, how are you? Good. Good. I think question and answer. Yeah. 
Could yes. you tell us what she's doing now? Sure. Um, she was teaching at the University of California, Santa Cruz, um, until about, let's say, two years ago. She's retired, but in her retirement, she's busier than ever because being an academic at least anchored her, so she could she could she would have to turn down speaking engagements all over the world. Now she just travels all over the world, um, being a visiting professor, speaking about the politics of the time. I mean, she, she doesn't like to talk about this period so much, except as a launching pad into discussing the prison industrial complex today, and her work um, to abolish prisons today. So she's you know. She's still doing uh, what she set out to do, that there is such consistency um, in her life in that way. And why this period, pretty much from 68 to 72, is so interesting is it's because you see her becoming Angela Davis. And so the film ends after the trial, of course, but you get the sense that her work continues. And then if you know anything about her, you know precisely that decade after decade, her work continued, whether we were paying attention or not. She did marry in the 80s, um, I, and I found actually the photograph in People magazine. <laughs> Archives, I know, people, know, people think, you know. Um, and there, a few years later, she was divorced, and then she's had uh, several very long-term relationships since then, but not me married. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With women. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I have to say, so one of the things, you know, the film, the film comes out, and people know her uh, life uh, today um, in terms of her preferences. And the thing is, back at that moment, I don't know what was going on. Uh, we know what her choices were, at least publicly. Um, but and so there's been there's always a little bit of discussion about that. She does have a permanent relationship. Yes, she does. She does. Uh, yes, yes. She's been she uh, she's been in a very serious, committed relationships. Did you know what I what I have observed over the years? Wherever she has gone to speak, the young people come out in droves. So her name resonates with with young people, and each succeeding generation of that. It's true. In fact, the, one of the first times I heard her speak, you had hosted her here um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary or the 60th anniversary. It was actually earlier than that, though, 72, uh, I think it was uh, 30 years. Thir 30 years. Yeah. 30 years. And it was really interesting because the, it was a giant hall. I can't remember exactly which one. It was packed. And um, Angela was the first person to speak. And Leo Branton was there. Margaret Burnham was there. It was all of the, the cast of characters. And she got up and she talked. And, and as soon as she sat down, though, half the room left. As though they had checked off on their list. I've heard Angela Davis speak. But the story wasn't told yet, you know? Because all the people that were sitting there were about to tell you the sto this story. And I was like, wow. You know, young people know her name and they know her face, but they have no idea the story behind it. And so hopefully what the film does is add dimension to that um, so that she's not just um, a black power icon, but that she is a, a woman who made significant cho personal choices by standing up and the repercussions of that and the whole international movement she likes to deflect, but you know, in order for um, a movement to happen, the first domino has to fall. Or you know, if she didn't stand up to Ronald Reagan, none of it would have happened. So she has to take a little bit of credit. I, I, I require her. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, since the movie ends with the end of the trial, it also ends on a relatively triumphant note, and I have the impression that the end of the movie makes most of the people who see it actually feel pretty good. And I was uh, wondering why, why you didn't choose to, to uh, connect it more to uh, Angela Davis's ongoing activism, and why you, why you chose actually a relatively happy and triumphant conclusion for the movie. For a couple of reasons, actually. Thank you for asking that. Um, we don't get very many victories. This is one. Yay for us. I, I mean, how many stories about people of color do, do you know, black Americans, that end victoriously in I the think media. The second reason I should say this is that uh, 
having gone to the trial as a student at Stanford uh, many years uh, uh, and having met her when I was a student there, this generation, young people, people took at this law school, have no idea who she is, what she did, who she was involved with, who she was trying to defend. And so I think the, the whole idea is that they need to first be educated about what she did, uh, given a way, first she was a communist, and uh, about communist, and uh, was fired at UCLA, I think it was. Yes. Uh, and she was very involved with the Black Panthers. Uh, and the third was that uh, the, the weapons were, I guess this was all in the film, yes. the, the weapons were connected with her, and that's why she was prosecuted. Uh, and that's why she fled. The whole idea was that, you know, they're coming after me to not just arrest me, but to kill me. Mm -hmm. uh, to make an example of me. Exactly, exactly. And I think that was very important to understand. And, and to underscore that, uh, so there are so many things that uh, we weren't able to include in the film, um, but, you know, I read the Holloman Diaries, and, you know, the day that they, the press announced that um, the guns were registered in Angela Na Davis's name, Haldeman writes, P, president, so pleased, guns registered in Angela Davis's name proves the conspiracy, yeah. right? right? So that there are there are ele the, there is the kind of context and the elements of this story. But to answer your question, the, one is a practical reason is that um, when you're raising money to make a film, nobody wants it to be three hours long, and there'll be less people to watch a a, a series um, in, in this kind of film. So there are choices about where, where the story begins and ends. Um, and I feel like Angela Davis also represents well the, today the work that she does. Um, she, you hear her speak and it's, it's incredible. Um, and the, 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 but the third point, well, which is really the first point that I made to you is that um, in the narrative of African American history, we don't get very many victories. And those of us who are interested in even those victories, clear cut, we win, right? Um, we just don't know about them. And here's one where Angela Davis is remembered as guilty. Most people ask me, so you had to go to Cuba to interview her? How cool. No, well, that's Asada Shakur. <laughs> and two, she was acquitted of all the charges. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes? Well, sure. Uh, um, part of the reason I make films is because I create cultural content that then exists and gives an impression. Um, and how is this important and why is this important? I don't think I really understood until I had children. Um, and I have a five-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, and my four-year-old is daughter, Violet. My five-year-old my five is Julian. And Violet, um, she hasn't seen the film, but she became obsessed with the trailer. It's online. I mean, really, she was like, Mommy, can I watch it again? I was like, all you have to do is press the triangle, honey, and you can watch it again. And she really, and she, she, would, she goes, that's Angela's mom. Her favorite bite of Angela was like, genocide, it's genocide, <laughs> right? OK, so what is the impact? Well, you know, my daughter has curly hair like I do, and it's big. And in the morning, it's big and unruly, you know? And she woke up one morning um, shortly, you know, after this binge episode of watching the trailer, and she caught herself in the mirror, and she turned to me and she went, Angela, Davis hair. <laughs> right? So I'm her mother, and I can tell her that she is beautiful and glorious and loved over and over again. Her father can do the same thing, but there's something about seeing yourself reflected in the culture that is, it, it doesn't replace, it just doesn't replace it. And so the more images there are, the more stories there are, the better off we are. And you know, when it comes to African Americans and it comes to our narrative, it is, it, it's, it's too late to start learning in college. 
to me. I feel, I, I'm still angry about that. <laughs> and no, I am not a victim. I'm a survivor. <laughs> yes. Film out in a commercial films in Boston, commercial theater in Boston, yes. for just two weeks, and then they took it off, and there was very little publicity. Yes. And this really needs to get a, a mass audience. Are you going to put it out in a, a commercial film? Well, we got we we were bought by Lionsgate and Code Black, um, and you know. They, they pitched us and we thought it was great and they were gonna put us in theaters, AMC theaters, which they did, and, and do this marketing and all of that. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The, di the big companies, they give you a week or two and if, you don't, if it doesn't take off, then they, they have a short attention span and they move elsewhere. But we were in theaters and we won an NAACP Image Award for Best Feature, feature Doc. Um, and the film exists. It's on iTunes. It is on Amazon. Um, and it just ran recently on BET Networks. So you can tell all your friends and have screening parties. I think it's important to have um, community when you watch a film like this. Because there are certain things you're going to go, oh my gosh. Like the white farmer. Yeah. You need to be able to turn to somebody and go, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> no way! <laughs> right? <laughs> you need to. Because it's not believable. And in fact, one of the things I like to say about this film is that nothing, if I wrote, scripted it for Hollywood, verbatim, right? You know, it's not believable, but it's true. big thing to me that was my wow moment was Obama's mother was white. I mean that to me in Kansas and from a farm um, because I remember all of the signs, you know, whites only, etc. So that was wonderful. I thought it <laughs> right, the farmer. <laughs> Very unexpected, huh? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Um, thank you for telling the story. How do you stay motivated over these eight years? <laughs> uh, Vince, don't contradict me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my husband. <laughs> he would get the play-by-play -play every day. Oh, my God! It's the end of the day. At the end of the day. <laughs> I don't know if this will ever be good. Oh. <laughs> um, hmm. One, Angela Davis is still alive. I, I could not imagine going to her and, and saying, well, guess what? Can't finish it. I failed. <laughs> That's one. But two, I had committed to it. And so I thought this film, I made a film about Shirley Chisholm and her run for president. Right? And I started that in 99 and, or ni 2000. And in 2004, it was finished and it premiered at Sundance. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have to find a subject that's going to be so much easier, at least somebody that everybody knows about. And I can raise the funds really quickly. Angela Davis. <laughs> you know, it took me a year to talk her into it. But once you, once you do that and you start thinking and imagining it be, uh, the story, it becomes part of, part of you. Um, and so to give you a sense of the, the time it took, eight years, um, I met my husband, married my husband, and we partnered on creating two children. <laughs> I made five or six work for hire projects one for the Mellon Foundation, two for BET, one for TV One, one for C three small ones for CNN. Blah, 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 blah. So you know, life continues. But if I'm going to, I'm committed to myself. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. It took seven years to raise the money. Yeah. It took wow. one year to do the film. Wow. So it yeah. Been, it took well. It's about two years. And during the making of the film. Uh, the cost of everything was so incredible. So not so much the production, but the cost of the footage. So when, by the, when I started the project, it should, it, it, I had budgeted a lot, like uh, what I thought was a lot, and it made sense for that time period. So it was a little over $100,000 just for licensing the footage. That number was eight years later closer to $400,000. Yeah. We're about to go into post. 
which is in Paris, because I had raised a third of the budget in France, because they were like, Angela, mais oui, oh la la, right? <laughs> and so the deal was I had to do the post in France, uh, Paris. I, I had to be there. Sorry, hon. <laughs> Take care of the kids. <laughs> um, uh, it, yeah, free shala. <laughs> and all working moms. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I digress. Um, and we needed to have the master footage. So what is the master footage? It's the footage you've paid for, so it's clean. It's the high resolution, all of that. And it literally, I called it the Hail Mary email. And I sent it around to all those people who had ever said to me, oh, you raised all the money for the film? Oh, I wish you'd come to me. I could have helped you raise some money. Yeah, exactly. And guess how many, I, spent, I sent about 30 Hail Mary emails. Guess how many responses I got? Two. I did. I got two responses. I got the nicest, oh, I can't help you letter email ever. I'm, you know, I was very impressed by that. I was very impressed by that one. And one person thought they could help me and kind of fell through. So I just got into the habit of like sharing my pain with people. And I'm online at Starbucks in Harlem. And a girlfriend of mine, you know, one of those, hi, how you doing? Oh, yeah. I see her all the time. She's all like, how's the film? And I was like, finally, I just said, oh, rah, rah, trying to raise money. She's like, I think I can help you. I said, no, you can't. She goes, yes, I can. She sent that film to her Hollywood friends that she knew that I didn't even know that she knew. Um, and um, one person returned the call. That was Jada Pinkett Smith. And she gave us, I mean, she met us in New York, and about two weeks later, she sent me a check. Yeah. It, it, the moral of that story is whatever you're working on, talk about it, because you don't know where the angels are. <laughs> you don't know where the angels are. And so she has a producing credit in the film. Didn't work one lick on the actual film, but you know what? That money counts. <laughs> And she gets to go around now and go, and she does, and I'm a producer on the film. <laughs> and yes, you are. <laughs> Small price to pay. Yes. Is it a, is it a, uh, speaking of young people, and you mentioned that Angela's work on the prison industrial complex, uh, is, it, is it fair to ask if, if you, with your skill in this project, might address uh, some of the less that some of the trials that have gotten less known why, let's say, of young people who are improperly incarcerated, which there are uh, countless numbers right. in the United States. Yeah. And well, look, Rochelle, Angela's story is the aberration, mm -hmm. by far. What's most likely is Rochelle Maggi, who's still in prison. He's still in prison, and he's still in and out of solitary. Yeah, and so I, I, every time I speak, I try and um, speak about speak about that because that's the that's the situation, you know. Um, and also to talk about the movement because the movement that was around her trial was extraordinary. But when you don't have movements like that, look what happens. Right? I mean, how many trials have happened recently where if there had been a better movement, Trayvon Martin. Um, the young woman, I'm blanking on her name, who shot warning signs in Florida. Yes, exactly. I just saw um, on the wire that um, a young woman, a young woman in Arizona, has has been given eight years for um, going to a, an interview and leaving her kids in the um, uh, parking lot. Um, although the kids were fine, nothing happened, she wasn't gone very long, but she, eight years of her, she's trying to do good, trying to get a job, didn't have any babysitting. Um, that seems punitive, right? I mean, that's an understatement. I, I mean, if you take so many, let's say, teen, late teens, or a young man in their 20s, who were incarcerated with, without adequate defense, and, 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 and have you thought of, of telling the story of all these young men throughout the country, and, uh, and maybe taking some illustrative cases with following it through with not necessarily a happy ending or maybe with sure. and how their defense can be structured with them? 
I, you know, so for instance, when I worked at, at CNN briefly, did a couple, I was called in, what do you want to, what do you want to do, uh, the president of CNN, John Klein at the time said. And I said, well, I've been thinking a lot about incarceration because I'm working on this Angela Davis film and let's do something contemporary. She's like, great. And I pitched him three stories um, on, ver three stories related to present day incarceration. And you know, the executive producers kept telling me, oh, we've heard that story before. Don't you have anything newer, something more fresh? Something, you, you know, so there is a kind of, dis there is not a kind of, there is a disconnect between the business of creating news and cultural content and what you as a consumer may want. And so then in that instance, it's up to Mr. Ogletree to raise a lot of money for the film fund that, you know, the, the race justice film fund. <laughs> I'll help you out with that. You, you can start a committee. We'll raise some money. I'm sure we can do it to tell stories, alternate stories, and then to make sure that you build the audience. Because once you can prove there's an audience for certain work, because on the business side, the only question they ask is, how many units did you sell? Exactly. The business. Yes. Um, this is a sort of more common question, but I wonder. The, the uh, question about um, why you didn't go on and talk about the life after the trial, what I keep thinking about is the, the, the film that's just been released about Anita Hill, where you know her trial, and it really was a trial, ended badly. But the movie goes on to show, the film shows how her life, you know, to, how she's made something out of that and, you know, has a rather happy life. Um, I mean, there are a lot of, there are obviously, you know, other, I mean, you talk about um, black women who are so heroic. Um, I mean, she's younger than uh, Angela Davis, but still, having, that, having seen that film very recently, it's hard to put it out of my head and seeing this. Yeah, you know, and different films have different objectives. Yes. And this is a historical documentary right. that is about how Angela Davis becomes Angela Davis. And there's room for more. It's not a comprehensive biography. It was never meant to be. Um, and those are, those are, in part, stylistic choices. Um, and, but I'll tell you, a film like the Anita film will grab a, a certain audience. It doesn't, uh, in its construction, grab the younger audience in, and take them to the moment in the same way. These are things that I hear. And so what is your objective? My objective was to show that film on, at B, on VET and to have that audience just resonate with that material just as much as you might. And I have proof that it's actually worked. <laughs> Angela Davis and I were at NYU, and the place is packed, et cetera. Um, and after the screening, um, you know, she's my Meryl Streep, so you know, everybody runs to her, and then there's a small line for me, and I'm chatting with, and there were these two young women, and they waited, they were very kind of shy, and they waited, and they waited, and they came up, and they said, oh my goodness, we caught the film on BET, we didn't see the whole thing, we had no idea, so we Googled, and we saw she was gonna be here at NYU, and so we came, and we just wanted to thank you for your work. <laughs> <laughs> we drove hours to do it. That is making a film to me, you know? So it's not just about the content. It's not just about saying she's okay. It really is about the emotional impact of the moment and conveying that. And so now somebody can watch the film and they can experience it well after she's gone. You know, the same with the, the Shirley Chisholm documentary I made. It's not a biography, it's about about this woman who decides to run for president in 1972, before women can have credit cards in their own name, unless they're married, before Barack Obama, before Hillary Clinton. And so, you know, that's a, that's a choice. Yes. Yeah, you had um, your hand up earlier. Yeah. I was just going to ask about, um, you were talking about meetings with CNN and Biden. Do you see, uh, you know, 2014, do you see, like, new avenues for distribution um, to create this kind of cultural topic? Uh, I do. Uh, what's been great about this year is if you, all the films that you name, people go, Hollywood is opening up. You know, it's so exciting. All of those films are independent films. They were financed completely outside of Hollywood, and then Hollywood comes in at a film festival stage um, and buys the distribution rights, and so, you know, even Fruitvale Station. Um, uh, that film was Forrest Whitaker. And um, 
and the the actress who won the uh, won the award, she's in the film. Oh my gosh, how am I blanking? It's Octavia Spencer. They put up their own money. She's in the film, and that's what helped galvanize. Uh, even Twelve Years a Slave, European money, Brad Pitt money. <laughs> yeah, um, and so. That's one avenue to go. Those are, those are still independent films. And I don't think, my experience with Free Angela, I'm not sure I would do it in quite the same way. That I think that um, part of the making is also then to make sure you find the audience. And traditional distributors don't see us. They don't, this audience does not exist to distributors. Yeah, so, yes. Well, two things. One, thank you for making the film on Shirley Chisholm. She's been a hero of mine since 1972. Um, and the other part, and it's connected to her, is this whole idea of race and gender. What's that? Race and gender. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important <coughs> to understand that, it, that race is very important, but when you combine race and gender, it just brings in so many other elements. And I thought that was really apparent recently, and certainly Shirley Chisholm, I believe, at one time was asked, but it was harder running for president because she was black or was a woman, and she said she was asked dumber questions because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And people did a question whether any woman could possibly be president. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to imagine yeah. now. But true. Yes. And still, actually, still true. Yes. Look at the way Hillary. <laughs> Yeah. But, the dip, but the absolute difference is when Hillary and Barack Obama were on the campaign trail, you know, n there was less of that than there would have been certainly in 1972, and they were so well respected for their intellects and for their experiences that they weren't completely dismissed. I mean, Walter Cronkite says, a hat, no, a bonnet has been tossed into the presidential race today, that of Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Yeah. And they cut to her walking outside of her house in a fur, of course, with a corsage, very well dressed. <laughs> um, you know, and that 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 kind of thing didn't happen in the same way. So, yes. How did you start on film? How did I start? Whew. Well, you finish one film, and the first question you ne there's no rest for the weary. The first question always is, what are you doing next? And I was really wrestling with that idea because as a black woman, I had made a film about a black woman. Did I keep, did I want to keep making films about black women and get pigeonholed or, you know, this is my very narrow, narrow thinking. And then I said, well, who's going to make the film that I want to see? So then I said, okay, well, let's just focus on that. And I was think Angela Davis's name kept coming up. You know, I would see her, I would see the cover of her book somewhere. Somebody would be reading it on the train. Um, it, her name would come up. And the most bizarre thing that happened was at Shirley Chisholm's funeral. A beautiful funeral. Everybody was there. There was, you, it, when you left, you had to leave uh, by this huge collage board, as big as the, the one part of this chalkboard. All these photographs of Shirley Chisholm, all these photographs of Shirley Chisholm. And there in the corner, on the side, and I, don't, I can't believe that anybody else would have seen it, was a photograph of Angela Davis, not with Shirley Chisholm, right? That would make sense. But somebody had just stuck a photograph of Angela Davis. <laughs> and I, of course, oh. <laughs> it was my sign. It was my sign. And so I was like, OK, I cannot ignore this. Let me try to see if I can contact her. So, of course, I send her a, an email, and I send her a letter, and then I send her an email, and she, of course, she, she doesn't answer any of those <laughs> I, um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I was getting nowhere for months, 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 um, and I was talking to a friend, and he said, well, what are you doing next? <sighs> I said, why do people keep asking me this question? And, you know, I don't know. I would really like to do this film about Angela Davis. But I'm getting nowhere. I've tried everything. I just, I don't get a response. And he said, you're not going to believe this, Shala. And two weeks prior to this phone conversation, and he had been, he's, he lived in the Oakland area, he had been to his high school reunion where he had reconnected uh, uh, re, uh, with a friend of his, this woman named Stephanie, who had been Angela Davis's assistant for more than 10 years. <laughs> he said, I think you should meet Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, and there is something to that when you put it out there, 
it comes, it, it comes to you. Sometimes it takes a little longer than you might like, but there you have it. So I had to, I had to follow the leads. So, uh, okay. We were okay on time? Yes. All right, great. Yes. Uh, did Angela Davis, was she a consultant on this film? Were there things she wanted in or out? Uh, our, my, uh, as the filmmaker, I was allowed to make the film that I wanted to make. That was our contractual relationship. Um, I, however, I did uh, let her see a cut towards the end so that if there was something that she really wanted to argue with me about, she would have the chance to. Um, and I cannot believe it, but you know, we met in Oakland. We were, all, we were alone. I brought the DVD player and the DVD, and the film was longer than this, so it wasn't quite finished yet. And I, she asked how long it was. I said, oh, close to two hours. She kind of rolled her eyes like, oh, really? OK. Puts the DVD in. And she didn't realize we were doing recreation. So the moment she sees the Afro image, she sits up. She goes, I didn't know you were doing that. And her, her body tensed up a little bit. Um, she was very nervous. Her, her, her foot wagged quite a bit. She um, teared up twice. I, so I was not watching her, but I was pretending not to watch her. I was, you know, in the back, kind of just trying to gauge her reaction. Um, and she had a very emotional reaction to the film. And when it finished, she said, wow, that was not as long. It didn't feel as long as I thought. Um, and I waited for her comments. And she said, it was very hard to watch. There's so much that I didn't know or I had never seen. Um, and she didn't ask me to change anything. Oh, that's not true. One thing. She said, because her... She wanted me to add more people that were part of the movement. And I said, well, I can't. It's not really about name checking, you know. <laughs> but she wanted Charlene Mitchell in the film. And so we found a way at, 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 to put Charlene Mitchell, who was instrumental in the Free Angela and All Political Persons Movement. Um, we weren't able to interview her. She's had a stroke. Um, and, but she's in there by name and then also by image, and that was the only thing. And so the way that I the way that I think about the relationship is she's very she's very much an academic, and she's very much like I was like one of her graduate students. She would approved the topic, and it was for me to make something of it. She didn't help me, she, but she didn't hurt me either. That was it. And I have to say that I hope you paid attention to the music. Vernon Reed did it. Um, Vernon Reed is a virtuoso guitar player who you may know from in living color back in the day. But he created the, the most phenomenal theme song for Angela Davis. Um, and we fought about it because I wanted him to rock it. I wanted hot, you know. It's, and he said, but there's so much softness and light in there. And so the theme song has a certain sweetness that um, I think is fits. Uh, anyway. Okay, thank you.